Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. And this week, we're joined by Jared Oldham out of Louisville, Kentucky, here in the U.S. Hey, Jared, what's up? Hey, Jonathan, how you doing? Good, man. Uh, excited to do this with you. Uh, so we we got in touch on Instagram, I believe, and uh, you are an elite road racer for which team? Uh, First Internet Bank Cycling. We're kind of based out of the Midwest, uh, but we do. Um, we're in a domestic elite team here. Um, and we focus on races that are on the PRT calendar and, um, also the other big races in the U S so PRT is the pro road tour, correct? Yes, that's correct. It's like the kind of the highest level of road racing here in the domestic scene in, in the United States. So that's like, um, what races would be within that to give people some context of where they might've seen sure. your team before. Yeah. Yeah. So we race, um, kind of there's it in call encompasses encompasses all different types of racing. So we do uh, races like the Redlands Bicycle Classic in California, uh, the Joe Martin UCI Stage Race in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, um, even races like Winston-Salem, which was a Criterium and a road race, and now I think it's just two Criteriums. Um, so that's kind of the, the level of, of races that we do. Awesome. Do you do any of the USA Crits uh, series as well? We do some of them. Um, we don't. We are not a deep one team. We kind of cherry-pick races just because of... Um, the USA crits races are very spread out and we're, we try and target. It's just hard to get to all of them with all the other races and stuff that are on the calendar, but we'll do, um, you know, we go to like Athens and, um, some other races that have been here before, but sometimes, you know, they're pretty far on the West coast. So it's sometimes hard for us to get to all. So you're a high level road racer. Um, but your, your, your stats are a bit mind blowing. So <laughs> you have, <laughs> you're at a 414 watt FTP. So over 400 Watts and you're weighing 166 pounds or 75.3 kilograms. So that puts you at 5.5 Watts per kilogram. I have so many questions. Like how do you even okay. fuel that much work when you burn that, when you have that high of an FTP? Um, uh -huh. but before we get there, I want to get into your athletic background. How long have you been a cyclist and what did you do before you were a cyclist? Sure. So I started, um, cycling, uh, it would have been kind of right when I was ending high school, my senior year of high school, that would be 2012, I'm 27 years old now. So that's, um, been a while, about nine years. Uh, before that I was a tennis player all through middle school and high school, um, and played, you know, kind of all year round. Uh, that was my main focus. So it's like, you know, just like going around playing tournaments, different in the Midwest region. Um, then kind of got burned out of that. And then. I think I found a, a Craigslist mountain bike for sale for like 200 bucks. It's like a old Trek 4,500. Um, and me and my friends kind of like went and started crashing around the different trails around here in Louisville. Um, went to school in, uh, at Purdue University and then um, got involved with the triathlon club up there because there's not so much mountain bike elevation um, in Northwest or North, yeah, Northwest Indiana. So um, I got into triathlon for uh, three years or so. And, you know, that was my introduction to like truly endurance sports. Um, how, how that. into triathlon did you get like, uh, were you mm -hmm. just doing an occasional sprint or were you focusing on longer distances or were you actually like competing at the pointy end? Yeah, I was, I got pretty competitive, um, at the Olympic and sprint distances. I really didn't want to, uh, focus on the long distance stuff yet. I was pretty good at high speed things. Um, so I would, you know, I, I would win, I would win a couple of local stuff. Um, I went to collegiate nationals a couple of times. I think the best result I had there was like a 40 something 40th place finish, um, up there. So out of like, you know, multiple hundred, I think I, you know, my best times were like, you know, in a sub two hour Olympic time, which, which maybe gives some people some context of like, you know, the time frame I'm doing. Were you training with power at that time when you got into this yet or? No, funnily enough, I kind of would just, uh, go out on, especially on the bike. I found like that was, um, what I was the best at and what I enjoyed the most. And I just go out and, you know, do group rides and, um, ride by feel some heart rate stuff. Um, towards the end, I started getting the power. Maybe that was more towards when I started getting tired of the whole swimming thing because it's really yeah. hard and I wasn't <laughs> a swimmer. Um, so I was like, you know, spending so many days a week in the pool just to try and get out of the pack, get out of the second pack um, with the, uh, with the high end guys. Um, so kind of, I guess of that. And then that's when I started transitioning more to cycling. I, was, I did some collegiate road racing and it's like, Oh, this is pretty sweet. Um, it's not just, you know, a time trial. It's more of the tactics really got 
me interested. Um, and just the, the dynamic nature of the racing was, was great. And it kind of suited my physiology maybe a little bit more than like the triathlon stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's when I started with training with power and everything like that. Go ahead. I would assume that just with tennis being, uh, you know, it, it could be a very long match, but you know, typically mm-hmm. some, probably sometime around what, how long were your tennis matches actually typically? I better ask rather than guess. Yeah, that's a good question. They can be, I mean, they can be all different ranges. I think the longest they go is like a three hour match would be a really, really long match because they're, you're playing three sets, basically best of three sets. So if it goes to a three set and every set's really long, um, but usually they're around hour and a half to two hours. The hard part about tennis, um, is that it's a lot of sprints. It's almost like a little, I, I guess it's almost like a physiological effort, similar to like a crit or something where you're doing, you're sprinting for 15, 20 seconds. Um, a lot of, you know, it's a whole body effort. Maybe you might not expect that, but it's a lot of generating power from your, your trunk and your torso and everything. Um, so you're kind of doing that and taking a rest and then doing it again, uh, over and over again. So it's longer efforts. It's like, oh, the duration is long, but the, the efforts are really short and condensed. You're crit racing before you're crit racing. It just looked like tennis. Yeah. So yeah, I was like, yeah. <laughs> and that, that sort of movement that you're doing with your body, it's, it's very explosive. It's being, you know, from the, from at the point of service at that point, you're still in ready, but then after that, mm-hmm. it's just surge, 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 just over and over. So that, that makes sense that going to steady state work was probably a foreign concept for your musculature. It was not used yeah, to that. <laughs> it was, um, it, it was funny. I think I remember telling one of my parents in, uh, in high school, like I, cause I just hated running for whatever reason. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, there's no reason to ever run more than three miles. And then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> within two years I was doing long runs of 10 miles and, you know, triathlons and stuff. So it's, you know, eight mile words for sure. How um, funny, huh? Yeah. So when you got into road racing, did you just gravitate toward criterium racing first or road racing? Uh, yeah, I think, um, crit racing is the most available racing form of racing here. I think in the U S in general, but especially in the Midwest, um, there's a really vib- vibrant crit scene, I would say. Um, so I, I did a lot of that, but even the road races, um, I like, they're just kind of harder to find for sure. Um, but is the, I mean, the collegiate scene was really cool because you do get like a time trial, a crit in a road race all on the same weekend, um, for, for very cheap and kind of get exposed to, you know, you have three race races in one weekend, you get exposed to a lot of racing really quickly. Um, but yeah, the crit racing I think is, um, it's one of my favorite styles of racing because it's very, um, you know, it's like a condensed form of a road race and it makes it, you need almost every, you know, tool, you need some tactics, you need fitness, you need technical ability. It's just, it's, um, it's like a road race, but it's all squeezing the 90 minutes. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Con- nice and condensed. Yeah. So what, what brought you to the point of wanting to get more data driven with your training and start mm-hmm. training with power and going through that whole process? Sure. I think it was just the natural next step. Um, I, when I was in, doing some triathlon, I was convinced I did some road racing. So I eventually upgraded to a three, I think while being a triathlete and I, you know, am a very, kind of competitive and, uh, type A and data and that kind of uh, data based person. Um, like I studied statistics and, and math in, in college. Um, so, you know, it just was like a cool thing to nerd out about, I guess. And, you know, reading all these books and getting really detailed about what this training is. I think I wanted to be more specific with it. Um, so that's when I got, you know, a power meter and started training, um, just for cycling specifically. Um, and, and really it took off from there, but, and, and then, you know, that was maybe the last year of my college career. And then I got a job, moved to Chicago, which, and lived in the city there. Um, and then, so that's when I really started to be like, okay, well, I have now have a full-time job. I can't just go do whatever I want, you know, kind of like college life. Um, so I was like, okay, I need to, I need to dial this in even more. I need to be, if I'm going to be competing with, you know, cat ones and whatever, and I'm trying to upgrade to the next level. I need to be really specific and, and focus, um, with the time that I have to train. So that's kind of when I started joined trainer road, um, from, you know, found that very, as opposed to like various other options, it seemed like the best fit for my, you know, kind of mentality, um, and took off from there. 
So when you started, do you, what sort of training stress were you taking or what sort of actually let's get away from training stress and just talk mm-hmm. about volume. What sort of volume were you doing when you were before you were working full time? And then once you were working full time, cause most of us listening to this, we probably have the latter circumstance. Mm-hmm. I, I actually think I almost is probably about the same. I think, um, college, well, doing triathlon, I do a lot of volume because you're just training for three sports. And I was doing, um, try like at, at the peak of it was doing 12 to 13 workouts a week, which is a lot. Um, and very mentally hard as you're not getting enough sleep. So, um, when I was just doing cycling, it was probably in the 15 ish hour range. And I think, um, as starting a full-time job, that's kind of what I tried to maintain a bit as I was trying to, you know, compete at the highest level of road racing in the United States at this point. Um, so I try to keep the same volume, maybe even a little bit more with when adding in commuting, um, to work back and forth on the bike. Um, and, uh, longer rides on the weekend. So when did you train at that point? Cause uh, it, these days you're self-employed and you're able mm-hmm. to have more flexible or a more flexible schedule to decide when you train. But when you are time boxed more, when did you fit in your training? You mentioned the commuting, but when did you fit mm-hmm. in all the structure? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about morning workouts. Um, and that that's what they do. That's just, I just can't do it. Um, it just doesn't work for me. I've tried it. I think one, one winter I was like, okay, I'm going to, even try and do, you know, an easy spin before work and then, you know, ride to work and then do a workout at home. And it's just, I can't get out of bed that early. Um, I just, it's hard, especially workouts and stuff. So I would train after work, I'd kind of come home, um, and be, and it made it hard in some points. You like, you come home and you're tired from a long day. It's a stressful day. Um, but I typically train in the, you know, at six to eight o'clock time frame. Yeah. Um, in the evening then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's my, that's my go-to. Yeah. So I guess the, the next question is what was your FTP when you started using trainer road? And uh, now we know obviously that it's 414, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is crazy, <laughs> but what was it when you started? You'd already done yeah. quite a lot of training leading up to that point. Yeah. I've done quite a, quite a bit. I think it was, you know, I started in the winter, so it's kind of come off a winter break, but I think my first threshold test is around 350 or so, which sounds about right. And then, um, it slowly built up over there. I mean, it, it didn't go from 350 to 400 in a year. It kind of went from, mm-hmm. you know, I peaked out like May 370 the next year and then 390. And it's like, it's just, you know, the cumulative build over years is, is kind of how I got to where I was. So what did you, or what do you follow? It's probably just more, most relevant to talk about now. Um, what plans do you follow and then how do you add to them or, or modify them? Mm-hmm. Um, we can get into adaptive training later because you've been using sure. that now for five weeks, but, uh, mm-hmm. what plans do you follow? Yeah. So I follow the high volume plans, which might not be a surprise, um, which are, I think are definitely hard. And I think, you know, I hear talk about on the podcast and other people like these are really hard programs. I think they are for sure. Um, so I follow the high volume plans. Most of the time I do do some modifications, um, mainly because trying to be competitive in long stage races and road races, um, and even, you know, the point ends of those races, what you need to be able to do that is, you know, you can complete for sure, you know, a hundred mile road race on, you know, two hour workouts for sure. But if you're trying to win them or be competitive, you need to be able to at the do high level efforts. Yeah. Yes. It's the, the races happen in the last 10 miles, 15 miles. And it's, very, very intense. It's like you need to be able to produce your maximal efforts at that point. So, um, I'm typically trying to add zone two endurance. I think the high volume plans have enough intensity for me, for sure, in terms of interval time and and time in those zones. So really what I'm trying to do is add on, um, long rides to the plan. So I'll replace, um, on Sundays, there's typically like a sweet spot workout that's two hours or so. So I'll either replace that entirely with a, a zone two kind of steady state ride where I'm um, kind of riding at what I would call like a chain type pace is how I describe it. It's just like always kind of trying to be on the gas as much as I can um, while we're in that zone. Sometimes I'll throw in um, even like integrate that sweet spot workout into a longer ride. So trying to, you know, build up a lot of stress, a lot of kilojoules um, over a long ride to be able to simulate kind of a race based effort. Um, during the week, I typically, um, am either taking the workouts, you know, I, I even being self-employed, I probably only have 
two to max three hours during the week, which is a lot of time for sure. Um, but that means I'm typically taking a workout as it is. And um, now that I live in Louisville, I'm doing a lot of my workouts based on the outside workouts thing. So I'm, mm -hmm. you know, adding time on basically riding out to a spot where I can do intervals and doing those intervals and riding home. That kind of adds on, you know, bookings it with like a 30 or so minute um, zone two endurance stuff. Um, the other thing that I, I modify with those high volume plans is I add in, uh, I typically replace the Friday ride. It's like, it's, it's like an easier ride. It's been probably an hour or so of like, um, zone two ish, but I make those like full recovery, easy, easy rides, like barely moving, you know, 15, 14, 12 miles an hour, um, mm -hmm. on flat ground. So, uh, just because I found that if I'm going to add stress, on to other workouts and make those really hard then i need to be ready for those and you know you can't just keep burning the candle all the time so you gotta be able to recover for sure yeah let's talk a bit about those z2 days that you put in the longer ones because mm -hmm. what i found is that uh a lot of us have a misconception about what those days are like we think like okay z2 day but it's a long day but it's still easy because it's z2 so but what sort of i assume that they're not always easy particularly at the end of a tough training week uh what sort of intensity in terms of like percentage of FTP are you trying to hold for those rides? And then are they difficult? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're for sure difficult. I think, um, if you're doing, if you're nailing all of your workouts and, and doing those, especially, um, my heavy weeks will get up to like 18 hours and sometimes even a little bit more. And, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're fried a little bit at that point on Sunday. It's like, it takes a lot to even get on the bike. And so it's more about, um, it's, it's almost like I would love to be able to hold, you know, like a, a 0.6, a to 0.7 IF and things like that. But even sometimes with heat or with humidity or different things, especially in the summer, um, it's almost like a feel of what's this endurance based and, and making it difficult for sure, but not like brutally hard because especially if you're doing a lot of intervals and, you know, three days a week of intensity, um, and you're, you know, run yourself into the ground on your aerobic rides. It's like, for me, it's almost a time to unplug because it's hard to, to make it difficult. If they're hard for sure, especially like the last hour is, you know, <laughs> you're ready to be home. I'm ready to be done. <laughs> um, but at that point, you know, you're kind of just, you're, you're going, but. Yeah. It sneaks up on you, right? Like yeah. at first you're kind of like, yeah, okay, this is fine. And then once you tie that into like, you know, your actual power output toward the end of it, you're like, oh my gosh, holding yeah. that is all really hard now. <laughs> it gets, it's really hard. And I think it's almost like you have this, you have like the first 30 minutes are tough because you're, you're tired mm -hmm. and whatever. And then you start to get in the room and you're like, oh, I feel great. Feeling good. And then around an hour, you know, maybe three or so it's like, okay, you know, I'm ready to be home looking forward to lunch or whatever I got going on the rest of the day. Yeah. Yeah. It's rough. Um, so, uh, follow the high volume plans. You add on additional Z2, you take that Friday usually is your day where you take, you make it intentionally very easy. You're not holding mm -hmm. to a power target. You're just spinning easily is, is the goal that you do. Uh, I want to get into how you specify for these road races. You mentioned the fact that like, so, and once again, let's keep context in mind in the sense that Jarrett's racing at truly the national level, the premier road race level for the U S right. So that's the pro road tour that we have. So these are the best road cyclists that we have in our country that race domestically. Uh, but that said, you mentioned that it's the end of the race sort of fitness that gets there what do you do in your training that helps you be successful with that? And it may not even be the long days, or maybe it's a specific type of interval that you do or something like that. But what do you find makes you most successful at the end of those races in terms of your training? Yeah, I think, um, I really try and focus on, you know, think about how my strengths play into that, those moves in those races, um, and where my weaknesses are. I think typically we talked, we touched on a little bit earlier, um, when I'm, when I'm fresh, I'm feeling I can do a lot of power, especially like for shorter durations. I, my, my, my kind of power duration charts all over the place. Um, like I, have, you know, as you can, as we talked about a decent threshold is pretty big, but usually my better zones are in the shorter, like 10 to five minute or so. And I can put out a lot of power and, and get away then. So it's more about unlocking that and be able to unlock that late in the races. So a lot of what I'm focusing on is the muscular endurance workouts, which is why I think the, the sweet spot stuff seems to really work for me and build that up to where I'm not 
tired um, at the end of races and can do it. But um, so that's, that's one way I, I approach it is how can I make sure that I'm, I'm fit and ready? I think another way that I do that is by maybe combining um, workouts with group rides almost to like simulate some sort of race speed. So I'll even sometimes we have a Tuesday night um, fast ride here in Louisville. That's, that's pretty difficult. Um, just like I'm sure everyone has someone, hopefully has something near them. Um, but I'm sometimes will go out and do some intervals to get myself tired and to simulate, you know, some sort of like race efforts at the beginning and then go to the group ride and then ride home. And that's usually like a bit, that's like about as hard as the day gets, I think for me. Um, but what that does is it simulates, Hey, you're getting some race speed that is close to what you would an encounter in you know the end of a race. And I'm having to do kind of dynamic efforts at race speed, um, that are, you know, aren't as structured. And so I, and it's just seems to didn't, you know, replicate that mind state. I'd also say those are really, really hard days and I don't do them every week because it's almost like <laughs> I do them again. And then I remember how hard that was. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that again next week. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, so you kind of have to use them sparingly, but I think that's, that's, I use, try to use group rides to supplement that. And also it's a great way to, you know, you get yourself out of your own head and you're too chatting with people. And I think that's one of the great things about cycling is interacting with people. So. Yeah. That muscular endurance work is so helpful for sure. Um, mm -hmm. and in race scenarios, it helps a ton. Uh, I want to ask, uh, a silly question, but are there downsides to having such a high FTP? Like, <laughs> have you noticed as your <laughs> FTP has risen that there's complications that come with that? Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, as you, I'm sure there's more upsides than downsides for sure. Um, but the downsides, I guess, if you want to phrase in that way, are just how much you burn during workouts. Um, like a, a two hour, like during a, a typical like trainer sweet spot workout, I'm burning a thousand kilojoules an hour. Um, which is a lot. So, and I, and I've been trying to improve my nutrition to scale along with that because I mean, I'm 75 kilograms, give or take, um, which is, you know, in the grand scheme of things, not heavy, but in cyclist land, it's kind of heavy, especially at some of these levels. And so, um, you're just trying to, feel, it just takes me more energy to get around than other, some other people. So I need to feel, feel better. I need to be able to eat a lot, you know, and I think that some of that comes on the bike. Um, and I'm trying to improve my nutrition and hydration and stuff on the bike, but really it is all, I eat a lot, um, like a shocking amount of, of food. And I think, uh, <laughs> hey, cause you just got to feel the work. And I think that's why, you know, I say 75 ish kilograms, so I don't, I don't weigh myself a ton because I think, um, when I start to do that and really get focused on weight, I, I, I get too much into that spiral of I need to, you know, maybe I won't have this, you know, second or third plate of dinner or something. Um, and instead, you know, think about, I need to lose some weight. And originally that creates a downward spiral of now I don't feel as good. I can't do my training as well. So it's really about for me, you know, making sure I can do my work and, and build power and, and do that that way, as opposed to trying to, you know, take the small gains to be made on the other side of the equation with weight and stuff. How much do you typically, and I don't know if you measure that out or, or if you do it in a different way, but how much do you typically, and what does that actually look like in terms of, uh, do you have any principles you follow to guide your nutrition? I don't, I, I don't do a bunch of, um, measuring of things. Uh, I think, you know, I'm sure I, I think of like, you have so many mental beams or bullets or different things to spend on your life. Right. And there are so many different things. And, um, you know, I have a wife, we have a house, there's other things going on besides cycling. And so, and, you know, obviously I have a job and all these different things. So I can only spend so much on different things. And so how do I place these items? Um, so I, you know, a lot of that's spent on bike and work and, you know, training itself and work and, you know, some other life things. And then I find that if I'm being really stringent and weighing food and doing that, which I have done, um, and I'll do maybe for short periods of time and really measuring that, and, you know, when I'm trying to build really into a specific A race or, you know, a focus event, um, then I'll really buckle down and do it. But I think overall, I try and guide it by just, you know, eating healthy and whole foods, um, and, and eating, you know, 
eating quality nutrition and eating when you're hungry and feeling using that to fuel it. And I think that seems to be a pretty good guide for me. And, um, you know, the, my body weight seems to fill out where I need it to. Um, and, and the train goes, I think as I eat worse and everyone does, um, if I eat worse and that's when things maybe aren't as good, and I get hungry more and then I eat, you know, bad food and make bad choices, but it's really about making good choices. Um, eating a lot of food and, and carbs and stuff. Um, that are, you know, whole foods and everything like that. My wife's a, an amazing cook. She is a vegetarian as well. So we have a lot of vegetables and stuff that kind of come into our diet naturally. Um, but that's kind of the, the approach I take. And I know it's like pretty hands-off and um, maybe, you know, touchy feeling doesn't give anybody hard rules to guide. But I think for me, it seems to be what works best. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of value in just stating that, that, there are different approaches than being uber quantified, you know, down mm-hmm. to the, down to the, yeah. to the calorie. So, uh, is there, what about on the bike? How do you feel that work when you're training on the bike? I assume you probably bookend your training with food coming in. That's very carb centric mm-hmm. and thereafter, but how do you feel during? Uh, yeah, I think I fuel with, I typically, it depends. Um, I find that you know, and if I'm doing a workout, that's two hours or less. I don't need a bunch of on bike nutrition. If it's hot, um, which it does get very hot and humid, especially here in the summer, I'll take maybe a, a bottle of scratch labs or something like that, along with a bottle of water to kind of help supplement some of that. And, and also have that as a recovery as I come home. Um, but as I go longer on the bike, I'm trying to eat, you know, the typical guidelines of eating every hour, right. I have, um, it depends on the training ride, but I'll typically go through, um, some sort of blocks or, or, um, even like I try and focus on maybe normal, more normal foods on like a longer ride. If I'm doing just a long zone two ride, I'm having fig bars or different things like that. And trying to have probably a couple hundred calories every hour, um, to supplement that work. I think it's hard for me to keep up. And I think that's probably the biggest area I have to improve upon. That's one of the focuses I've had this year is, eating more during training and races Mm -hmm. that way, um, you know, you feel better. It's, it's so obvious to everybody. Like it's so obvious that if you eat more on the bike, you'll feel better. Um, but sometimes it's hard to do. Yeah. It's really hard to do for sure, man. Mm -hmm. We get you on 90 grams an hour of just pure (laughs) race gas and you're going to be ripping. Holy cow. That's that's what I'm, uh, I'm trying to build up to that. I think. But yeah, if you're awesome. at 414 now, holy cow, you're going to be even higher. So yeah, 90 grams, man. 90 grams an hour. That's a lot. That feels like, oh my gosh, I'm just tired of eating, tired of feeding yeah. it all. But it's just, I think it's just making it second, make second nature. Yeah. And I think that that's when you get into like the more distilled and focused mixes that are really mm-hmm. just, just carbohydrate effectively. And sure you can throw in the electrolytes that you need on top of it, but it's really just like that glucose fructose sort of balance. Mm-hmm. And that's when man, that's when you hit jet fuel. Jared, if you're at 414 now, oh my gosh, once you start fueling like that, it's going to be insane. Um, so with that high FTP, do you target time trials at all? Just because even though your physiology lends toward more bursts with that sort of an FTP, you can just carry so much speed. Um, so do you focus on time trials at all? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I've had, I've had some decent results in time trials, uh, at races I've gotten, um, I think I got third in the uphill show Martin time trial last wow. time ahead. It was 2019 and was second um, at the Redlands time trial, which are both shorter, like 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, I, I target time trials. I think um, I need to, I've been, you know, I in 2019, I was planning on we were really focusing on time trials, going to nationals and doing that thing. So I got a time trial bike, was really good dialing in that fit, and then got into a, an injury where I broke collarbone. Um, which kind of threw a, threw a wrench in that whole thing. And I still ended up coming back and doing that, uh, nationals, amateur nationals and did okay. But was definitely lacking some power and time on the bike. Um, and I haven't really focused on this year because there haven't been as many time trials that have their kind of TT bike requirements, but for sure I do focus on them. I like, um, my favorite time trials are the ones that aren't necessarily like the pan flat, um, you know, 40 K ones is kind of the ones that, maybe a little bit more rolling and require some more pacing and, and feeling it out. Cause I think, um, my strengths in that are lie in the ability to, um, maybe step away from the power meter a little bit and, and use feel, um, to feel out when you need to be pedaling harder or easier. 
Um, because, you know, if you're going down a hill and doing 50K an hour, you don't really need to be pedaling much harder. Like it's almost like you need to conserve some energy and maybe save it for an uphill. So, in, and, you know, utilizing that energy where you can. Um, so that's the, kind of my favorite time of kind of time trials. And that seems where I do the best for sure. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's a, a tip for a lot of people is I think that you, as you, and I think that when you train with power, you build that intuition, like that connection mm-hmm. with your effort. And, and sometimes it's very much like a ride by numbers sort of a thing. And sometimes it isn't, um, it really depends on how the course and how the day is going to force you to execute really. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think you need, you, that's the, I think the number one thing you need to do when you're training with power, it's a, it's a great tool to use. Um, but you need to be generating that feel of like, what does this, what does this feel like? What does this effort kind of feel like? What can I sustain? Um, and being able to, to know that I think, you know, um, my strategy going into a time trial or, you know, Strava or whatever, is I have an idea of like, I think I can do this for this much. Um, but in the moment you got to be able to sort it out and, and feel, you know, is this sustainable over this period of time? Um, and do I need to be pushing harder or easier? Cause I mean, you know, time trials are all about going the fastest, right? It's not about who puts out the most power, puts out the best hour average. I think that's sometimes what we forget. It's like, you want to be able to just point to that file and be like, look what I did. Um, that was awesome. Um, but if you're not going the fastest, it doesn't matter. So it's all about how can we go faster? Even that's, you know, tucking into more air position, really making yourself go quicker with less effort um, during certain parts of the course. Um, but that's all fueled by, as you mentioned, when you're training, you know, what does this zone feel like? And, and really being able to almost not be staring at your power meter. Um, I think that's one of the benefits, um, you know, of, of outside of riding outside some indoor has makes you, I think, super buff and, and great. And it's a great training tool for sure. Um, but being able to feel out, you know, different, ter- you know, changes in the road gradient, whatever, and be able to keep that effort and power steady um, without looking at your power meter all the time is a great tool, especially in, in racing and breakaways, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good way to be able to make sure you don't blow yourself up when yeah. you're sitting on the line, right? For Did sure. you, when focusing on the time trial stuff, do you do your training in the aero position on the TT bike? And how much time do you spend on your TT bike? Yeah, I think uh, when I'm focusing on that, I'm spending probably once a week or so on, on TT bike. It might be, um, kind of, it's usually the steady, a steady or state workout. Um, I think it's, you're trying to do two things in your, in your time trial. Like you're trying to get familiar with that and then be able to build, you know, the comfort you have with it. So that way, hopefully your power that you can put out in that position matches what you can put out in the road position. But on a road bike, you're hopefully, you know, maybe touching up and hitting higher power zones. So as, as you get closer to the event, you may be spending more and more time on that. Um, but I think also I've had, I spent enough time in triathlon that I spent a lot of time on TT bikes and different things. So I'm pretty familiar with them. So it's not like a completely foreign feel. So that I think that definitely helps me feel jump on and feel pretty good pretty quickly. But I think as you, as your duration stretches longer and longer, you definitely need more and more time on that bike in that position, especially with, you know, the importance of keeping a position fast and arrow. Like, um, you know, I find that if I haven't spent enough time on it, my head starts popping up. Everything starts popping up. I'm like, I'm wanting to get out of it. Whereas when it, when it's all dialed, you're, you know, super low and your head's behind your hands and all that stuff. Yeah. So, uh, Jared, to wrap up with this, what do you feel like, and I'm probably putting you on the spot here for this one. So Mm -hmm. I apologize, but what do you feel like have been the most instrumental inputs, like things that you have done to make you faster as a cyclist. So like looking mm-hmm. back, what are the things that you've done that have been most beneficial? That could also sure. be things that you have omitted or avoided as well. Yeah. I think um that some of the things that really focus on are being consistent over time. Um and that's within blocks, that's within um you, you know, over the course of a year and and really over the course of, you know, multiple years. That seems to be what it, what makes the most difference. I don't think there's any I don't know if there's any magical intervals. I think there's some that might help you more than others and might prepare you for certain races more than others. But if you're spending more and more time and really focus on, you know, doing what you can and, and, uh, over the course of time, it's going to really, you know, it's like a, um, it's like an accumulating interest or, you know, compounding interest. It's like, it's going to keep building upon itself. And that's really something that's really beneficial. Um, I think, uh, let's see. Another thing that I think is really important 
is um, the ability to kind of, we talked about like feel different efforts and what they feel like, but also understand how your body is in, in certain times of um, like when you're tired, when you're not tired, when you should be doing certain intervals, when you shouldn't. I think there's, um, as you train more, you need to be able to, it's realizing, you know, is this a bad hurt or a good hurt for this certain type of workout? Is this, am I on top of this interval or am I just swapping? Am I just swimming and just going to drown in this effort? And if so, then maybe it's time to, to pack it up and go home. I think that's instrumental, especially as you are doing more and more racing, like we're doing, especially in the summer. Um, and, you know, when race season going on, you're racing probably every other weekend, if, if not maybe more. And so sometimes you're just not going to feel good. And so you just need to be able to, if you wake up, um, and you're not feeling as good, maybe you need to be able to be flexible in your schedule and be okay with that and forgive yourself for not being a machine. You know, it's not Mm -hmm. these numbers that we use like power and and TSS and and normalized power, like they're all well and good, but they have limitations um, because, you know, TSS doesn't tell the whole story. Um, 100 TSS creates a lot harder than 100 TSS aerobic ride. And some days, you you know, that's going to carry over if you do three of them in a weekend you're going to be tired for a couple of days. And so, um, being able to understand and be like, okay, you know, maybe I don't get as much TSS as I wanted to in this week, but I also did a lot of this and, you know, race stress is different than training stress. Um, and understanding all that stuff. I think it's, you know, being flexible with your training plan is really, it's kind of like a counterintuitive, like you have these two weights, right? You have a weight of, I want to be consistent and, and really build and be consistent with my workouts and progressing that, but also you need to be able to be flexible with, you know, life and different things that come in. And I think that's, um, that's, I mean, that's the, the trick, right? It's finding that balance and when you push and when you don't. For sure. And along those lines, this will be the last point that we'll cover. Mm-hmm. What has your experience been like with adaptive training so far? Like how, how is it, uh, how is it, has it aided that balance in trying to find the right mm-hmm. workout, I guess, for the right day so that you don't feel like you're just drowning in the interval? I think it's, um, tra- adaptive training has really helped me I think by, it felt like there was a couple of times in the high volume plans where I do this workout. I'm like, this is an insane workout. Like this is, I feel it pretty good. And this is really, really hard. And some days you make it through and some days you weren't. And I think that's because of, you know, do you have, do you do have different strengths in different zones um, based on what your threshold is at that time? So I think breaking it out into those separate zones seems to be, it's intuitive to me and it makes sense of, you know, where you are and what workouts are certain levels. I think that's the biggest benefit of that is mm-hmm. I'm doing a you know threshold five or whatever. And if I do a threshold 5.5 next week, that's great. Like this felt great. So that means I probably can do this. And I think that's been really, really helpful for sure. Um, and just uh, maybe making some of those workouts feel like this is a, re- this is like attainable. This is reachable for sure. Yeah. That, that achievable level is where we usually want to be, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's tempting to feel like every day we need to just completely slam ourselves and, you know, barely make it through the workouts. And if we're doing that, then that's really like extending our abilities. We feel like it's kind of like that last rip, last rep myth, right? In the sense that like, it's not productive unless you're brought completely to your knees. And that's not the truth, particularly when we're talking about like aerobic training, like, which is what we're doing, right? Like it's, it's much more about like what you said, the consistent cumulative load that we have that compounds and it brings about the gains that we need. So, yeah, for sure. I think that's, that makes complete sense. And I agree with that. Um, you have, you, I might have like one workout a week or a couple of workouts in a block that I'm like, I'm not looking forward to this. This is going to be really hard. Um, but most of the other time it's, you know, it's achievable because if you, if you're doing three workouts a week that are making you want to not ride the bike, then how long is that going to be sustainable? Right. You're trying to do this over the long term and, and be consistent and also have, you know, a positive mental mindset for racing. That's like the number one thing I think when it comes to performing on races is being mentally locked in and ready to go. And if you're, you're blowing yourself out in training, it's going to be hard to be, be, be locked in, you know? Yeah. Good luck rallying, uh, when you're in a down yeah. mindset like that. Yeah. yeah for sure. tough. Well, um, Jared, this has been awesome. Thanks for doing this. Uh, excited to, I've, I've seen your team racing at the different PRT races and I'm excited to see mm-hmm. you guys continue to race. And, uh, we now have a, a face and a name and a whole podcast to go with one of the athletes out there. Uh, yeah. how can people get in touch with you, Jared? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Jarrett Rides Bikes. It's J A R E T. It's a weird spelled name. Um, that's probably the, that's the best way. It's my 
social media that I update the most is still not the most in touch, but um, I post a lot of race updates and they do some stories following us to the races. Um, I'm also on Strava. I post all my training on there um, with power meters, with power data, and sometimes heart rate data if I can be bothered to put on the strap. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you're always, I'm always happy to share my training and, and answer questions there. Um, let's see. I think that's, that's probably the two best ways. I'm also on the trainer road form. I don't check it a bunch, but I'll, um, I'll be in touch for sure during this workout. If anybody has any questions or thoughts. Awesome. I appreciate it, Jared. Um, so once again, Jared's an elite road racer for the first internet bank cycling team. He also is his project that he's working on right now is, uh, it's called the lead out app and it helps people find different group rides and different spots to be able to connect with each other, connecting the world of cycling, which is awesome. So I just really appreciate you doing this, Jared. I'm excited to see how your racing goes and I'll be cheering for you. Yeah. Thanks. You we, we know, we know the help we can get. So, uh, appreciate <laughs> coming on and, um, yeah, be happy to connect with anybody at races or, um, always hopefully it's helpful for another, another cheer too. Awesome. Thanks a bunch, Jared. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. You too.